we're going to take a minute to look at this beautiful painting by Frederick Church and see if we can use it to learn to think a little more scientifically. This is Aurora Borealis and it was painted by him in 1865. It's a fairly large painting. Just take a minute and see what you notice, what jumps out at you, what you're curious about. Do you have some questions? Do you notice how the colors are reflecting down here on the surface? Smooth surfaces tend to yield much more faithful reflections, and this is certainly not a perfect reflection by any means. We're just more aware of sort of the blurry colors, the redness here, the blue over here. We're so used to seeing reflections everywhere that we tend not to notice them. Sometimes it takes an artist's eye to point this out, and it certainly is noticeable here. Let's take a minute to look at these beautiful colors in the sky. Do you notice these lines, these series of lines that appear to be converging? Where have you seen that before? Have you ever seen the sun streaming through an opening in the clouds, showing this sort of radiating shafts of light? Or have you ever noticed that lines of a road, if you're traveling on a long straight road, they appear to converge in the distance? The place where they seem to converge is called a vanishing point. And they're obvious when you have parallel lines of something, such as roads or buildings. We don't typically see vanishing points in natural scenes because there aren't a lot of instances of parallel lines that occur in nature. So if you take away all the roads and the buildings, you're not left with much. But these radiating lines of light or rays of light with their vanishing point that's not, again, you'd, you'd kind of have to trace it with your mind that they go down to a point somewhere near the horizon, that's evidence that the light we're seeing is parallel. But I know what you're thinking. I thought that light radiated from a source in all directions. And that's certainly true. It's certainly true with the sun and light bulbs. In fact, the sun, it's, that's sort of a, a separate case that the sun gives off so much light, but only a teeny tiny portion of it really reaches Earth. And by the time it gets to us, the sun's rays are, in fact, fairly parallel. And that's why you see, when you see the sun kind of bursting through the clouds in this radiating shaft of light, that's why you get that convergence, because those that light is parallel. But this isn't light from the sun. So we don't have that explanation for us. This light comes from excited particles in the atmosphere. When particles that are high in the atmosphere are ionized and excited, they give off light like they do anywhere that particles are excited and ionized. In fact, that's what happens in a fluorescent tube. And since the particles are charged, they can be shaped and line up according to Earth's magnetic field which if you've ever studied Earth's field, magnetic field, or plotted the field around a magnet of any kind, you may have noticed that those field lines are parallel. And that's what you're seeing here. These charged particles are lining up according to Earth's magnetic field lines. Do you notice the different colors? What colors can you see? Sort of an aqua, we call that cyan in our science class, and this gold, sort of a scarlet over here. Different colors match up to different amounts of energies. If you've had the chance to study flame tests, rocks, stars, all, or even atoms, they all have this characteristic in common that if they're excited in a specific way, they can give off light. And the light they give off is very particular to what they're made of. And so you can look at the light they're giving off and make a conclusion as to what the substance is. That's how we can identify certain rocks. It's definitely how we identify or what stars are made of. Because we look at the light coming from the stars, we analyze the color of that light, and then we know, oh, it must be made of hydrogen or lithium. And that's definitely what's happening here. It's different substances that are giving off different wavelengths of light that corresponds to different colors of light. When we study these images, we have these images on our walls in our classroom just because they're so fascinating to look at. But when we study them, I often put them online and we can zoom in as we're doing here 
and get to some incredible detail. In fact, the first time I shared this with my students, they showed me so many things I had overlooked because I was completely fascinated by the northern lights and not really focused on the rest of the painting. But they noticed this, and perhaps you've noticed it too, that the ship has a light on. And so that causes us to ask a bunch more questions. Who's on the ship? What are they doing? What time of day is it? Is it winter? Is it summer? Could you figure that out? Well, you can figure out sort of where they are because of the title of the painting. And the title of the painting is Aurora Borealis. Do you know what that means? I've alluded to it here, called it the Northern Lights, and that's another name for it. Aurora is actually the, I think it's the Roman god of the dawn, and Borealis is the north wind, I think. And I think it's credited to Galileo because in his lifetime there was an unusual display of the northern lights and they were able to be seen much further south than typical. And so from his home in Italy, Galileo saw them and they look like the dawn. They don't come up at dawn. In fact, they come up at night um, in the dark. But it looked like the sun was rising because he, because he could see this glow in the distance and so he called it the Northern Dawn, and that's where the name comes from, Aurora being Dawn and Borealis being North. So back to when we were talking about the reflection and could this be ice or could it be water or what's going on there. Look what you see here. Again, I missed this the first time around. Yeah, it's a dog sled. And obviously the dog sled typically run on ice, and so this is... This section right here has to be ice and not water. No doubt there's lots more we could talk about, but I think we'll leave it there. In our classroom, we have art like this on the walls. Sometimes we have a discussion about them, like the one we've had here, but primarily they serve just as a beautiful reminder of how things are connected and how studying one area of interest can often inform another. If you're interested in adding these types of studies to your classroom, I'll leave a link in the description below. And if studying light intrigues you, I'll leave a link to some resources for that as well. And please stop by my website, engagingsciencelabs.com, to find out more about curriculum and courses for middle school science.